have to do is to accommodate the growth. Certainly one of the things that we don't advocate is the continued sprawl in, in, in other areas of, 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 of uh, outside Toronto, and certainly the province does not as well, where the places to grow up. So zooming in, this is the stretch on Queen Street, and you can certainly see that in the study area, the study area is within the avenue. So avenues, what does the official plan say? It says avenues are four corridors along major streets where urban reorganizations are participated and encouraged to create new housing and job opportunities while improving the pedestrian environment in the middle of the street. And we know that there's a lot of community concern about the application that was approved unanimously with the planning's recommendations, which was approved based on the recommendations found in the official plan. What we are proposing today is to work on is very different from this. And you would say it's much better in terms of the fit and character of that stretch of the street. I'm going to go back to the council motion. The council motion talks about the avenues in the mid study, uh, which uh, the second paragraph says that it is excluded from this portion of Queen Street. So, um, development applications in forms of rezoning had been submitted at the time when this motion was put forward and recognize the, the significant community concerns with those applications. It's widely recognized by all involved, including the councillor, that the, the uh, current beaches design guidelines were out of date, and that is why we're here today. So it's a very long, exhausted explanation, and now we're going to actually get right into the guidelines. So starting with an introduction, beaches and neighborhood ritual history, while at the same time has aspirations to be more modern and sustainable community of Green Street, it's a street in which Small town charm and proximity to Lake Ontario and the beach make it one of Toronto's most important tourist destinations for tourists. This is a table of contents. And what we're trying to do is to paint a picture of the area. And the guidelines are really intended to be read in their entirety. And when you read the guidelines in their, in their entirety, then it talks about and paints a picture of what the guidelines perceive the Main Street to be. So there was an introduction that we talked about. History of the beach, the beach and its importance as a tourist destination. We put these two sections in again because it helps paint the picture, paints the picture of what Queen Street is today. General urban design guidelines. We had a lot of talk about whether or not we should look at some sub areas. We'll get to that. And then these are the sub areas that the guidelines will actually talk about. They actually reference the three distinct beaches in the area. We're going to talk about architecture and design. And lastly, sustainability. So the urban design guidelines apply to sites which have frontages on the main street, both north and south, from Coswell in the west to Neville Park and Nursewood in the east. I had a lot of discussions about sub areas, and, and certainly there was no conclusion, as Nicole said. Some people said no sub areas, some people said five, some people said three, some people said two. But there was some consistent idea about thinking about the different beaches and making connections with the beaches and using that as, as definitions of sub-areas within the study area. And certainly we see that there's different characteristics in each of those three sub-areas. So I'm going to talk a bit about the history of the beach. And I'm just going to summarize things because of course we haven't had the entire package. Um, special thanks to uh, the team from who gave us an excellent, excellent history lesson and a three-hour tour of the beach. But it actually talks about how the beach was established in 1794 by the Ashburns family, how Ashburns Bay was at one point in time larger, and that actually restricted access from Toronto to this area, and that's why the area was sparsely settled in the 19th century. Talk about the many amusement parks that occurred from the late 1800s to 1920. Um, talked about the late retired soldier that purchased land for a farm and called it Key Farm, which of course later became Key Gardens. And talk about the origins of the boardwalk, the fishing wharf, and how it was actually uh, transformed up until 1979, finally connected as a major public community. We wanted to talk about tourism in the beach as well. And we referenced specifically in the document, pull the quote from Tourism Project, because it again reinforces the importance of this neighborhood as a tourist destination. One of three in the city that is known for its small town charm. It's this forest hill village. So we thought that that was important to reference as well. So I'm going to get into some of the urban design guidelines for the entire stretch. 
So these apply to the entire three kilometers from Coxwell to Meadow Park and Public ground. We've certainly heard the ideas of wider sidewalks from the vast majority of people, although not 100% of the people. So we're proposing sidewalks that are 4.8 meters. And that includes an edge zone, planting zone, a fairway for pedestrian traffic, and then an edge zone inside the building phase, which could include things like fruit stands on the road etc. So I'm here the importance of landscape, whether it be the initiatives of the BIA, hanging baskets, or the idea that a vintage retail owner that's putting a, 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 a flower pot in front of their storefronts, looking again at the outdoor cafes and the fruit stands and storefronts that are very much part of the character of this area. Certainly heard a lot of support for this idea of synergy with Lake Ontario and the making these connections north and south. So we want to make sure that existing views from Queen Street and points further up are protected when we look at the uh, Very, very much characteristic is the idea of recessed storefronts, and that actually even means that the storefront windows are more interesting. And also means that the store door springs don't actually feed into the right way. Site organization significant buildings will be retained and reused in the examining course on the top of the Belvedere Church. Retail commercial windows, which will be modulated, and uh, and we had a number of discussions about the floor to ceiling glass, and, and, and certainly it's been outlined to us as well about some of the merits of that, but we still want it to be framed to pick up on the rhythm and articulation of the street. And then curb cuts and making sure that all parking and access to parking is off of Queen Street so that, of course, we don't interrupt the pedestrian walkability of the street. Something else that we've heard about in here, especially in the last SAC meeting, retail rhythm reflect the existing law patterns. This is different from the next slide that talks about architectural rhythm. And we also heard that new developments should be designed in such a way that does not restrict the possibility for restaurant use. Outdoor cafes and restaurants are very much part of the character of the area. There's been some condominiums recently proved that will not have restaurants because they don't have appropriate mechanical handling systems or garbage. So we put this in the guideline and we think it's very important. I love this image uh, courtesy of the Virgin from uh, it's from Holland and Virginia in the world. Uh, thank you. But we use this to actually outline a strong vertical and horizontal rhythm. This is actually a guideline that we have removed and we put back because what, the, what it does do is it suggests that that elevation that you see will not be a continuous curveball sheet. The idea of a strong vertical and rhythm, something that seems quite simple and obvious, but it is actually something to reinforce what we are looking at in the guidelines. Now, we have a lot of discussion about breaking up the street wall architecturally. This is not about the storefronts. Into rhythms of 6 to 12 meters, and this is depending upon where you are, the rhythm gets tighter. And what this, what this implies is that even if you have buildings, for example, that are of a scale that work well, because they are continuous and uninterrupted, they don't necessarily reflect the character of each. The image on the left uh, we heard does in terms of its rhythm and articulation, so that's something that we had put in the guideline as well. Now, these are some examples. We're not necessarily saying that this is an appropriate building for the beach, but we're saying this is a long building that's broken up to look like it's several buildings. Example from Ottawa. Again, another building broken up to look like it's more than one building. To fit into the rhythm and character of the street. There's another view of that on the bottom. And then on top, an elevation of the building is on Main Street that I'm sure you're familiar with. And then some massive studies that we did as well to talk about the rhythm and articulation of the street wall. The idea of roof lines will be detailed with cornices, pitch roof doors, and parapets to maintain the character of the area. And buildings uh, which are located at terminuses of north south streets may actually contain architectural elements that reflect that terminus. Rear buildings must transition to the neighborhood so that their shadow impacts are within those of the gas right now. Uh, and the mechanical stair towers and penthouses should not be visible from Queen Street. Balconies facing onto Queen Street will be recessed. We certainly learned uh, that in some cases, balconies which protrude take away from the street wall and take away from the sky, the sky view of the street. So we want to make sure that they are on recess. We also want to make sure that residential entrances are distinguished from retail and commercial entrances. Buildings can use high quality materials, things like uh, brick, natural stone, siding, wood. Uh, we 
we want to we want to discourage exposed concrete block. The image on the lower left is from Cabbage Town. It's a great building. It's a brand new building, but it does have an exposed concrete block wall, uh, and that's one of the things that we would like to make sure that does not go forward. Inch is rich with history, so the listed and designated buildings are preserved in their entirety. This is again citing our official plan policies. So it's also uh, making sure that preserving only the facades is discouraged. And this is a development constraint map, which we have shown the group many times before. What this does, is in terms of the entire study area, it shows a number of areas where we think it's highly unlikely that will be redeveloped for several reasons, or one, one of several reasons. One is it's an existing condominium. Uh, it's uh, under construction. Uh, there are apartments with more than six units. It's a heritage building, or, or land that is owned uh, as a neighborhood in New York what you see in the beach triangle area. Construction of arcades and colonnades and internal malls are dispersed because it takes away from the street life and the animation on the street. And a variety of signage is incurred, although that signage, although it's governed by a sign bylaw, it should be in the character of the building. So we view this the building on the left as a signage that is in character of the building, and one on the right not only is it not in conformance with the sign bylaw, but certainly does not reflect the character. And these weather protection, of course, are encouraged. So those were the general guidelines that apply to the entire project. We're going to break it down now into the three separate sections. And, and this is actually something that we were really excited about. And it came from suggestions from the SAC. And that is to take the existing divisions on Queen Street and actually um, use them to establish the precincts. So if you look at the street signs carefully, you haven't noticed it. They'll actually make reference to the beaches that they're adjacent to. So the historic Woodline Beach, historic Hugh Beach, and historic Long Beach. All referenced already, all, all part of the subdivision that exists today on Queen Street. So we had a number of discussions that talked about whether or not we should have three, five, but this is the one that I think we're excited about because I think it speaks to this connection and the synergies that they got to create on the beach. So starting with the Woodline Beach precinct. Um, it's from Coxwell to Woodbine. In this precinct, we see a number of possible redevelopment sites, particularly west of Kingston Road. We don't really see too many east of Kingston Road, and I'll highlight why, and that's largely because of the, uh, the uh, neighborhood's designation. Woodbine Park, of course, is a very important part of this public realm, and there are a number of buildings here that are of interest from a heritage point of view. Here's some pictures of that existing streetscape. We have some award winning buildings here as well, and some buildings that went to Rockwell. And then we have the KFC. So uh, certainly opportunities here to look at improving the streetscape, improving the quality of the development. Um, Woodbine Park again is an important part of the public realm. I like this, this development, which did a in an urban design work for its wide sidewalks, outdoor cafes, and the amenities that it provides to the public. So in terms of passing, you certainly see that um, along Queen Street in this area, there is a defined that has been um, already um, proposed and is uh, under construction. We actually see no reason to change that. So this is where we'll see the largest forms of development in the study area. And, and these, this may be plan to be consistent with the building that's under construction right now, which is at one range here. This angle of plan is actually less built form than a uh, mid-rise building would suggest. And it's talking about going on 12 and a half meters of the street wall and then setting back at 45 degrees. That street wall is set back 4.8 meters from the curb to provide a wide sidewalk. The image of what that building will look like, well, of the one that's under construction. And why we say development will largely in this precinct occur west of Kingston Road is because if you zoom in on the triangle area, you see a number of sites that are in yellow. Those are neighborhoods as defined by the official so that angle would not apply for the neighborhoods. And then there's heritage buildings, buildings under construction, and condominiums. So really, in this whole stretch that you see here, there is not a lot of uh, opportunity for redevelopment. Of course, the south side is all condominiums. So that's why we're saying any growth here really will be directed west of Kingston. Fire Mall is, of course, an important landmark. We spent a lot of time studying the views. We want to make sure that we protect the views of the, the Fire Mall Clock Tower. We looked at the approaches from Northern Dancer all the way up to Boardwalk. We certainly see that it's about two and a 
half blocks away that one can actually see the block tower. Can I get back to that? Actually, when we get into the QE precinct, which we're talking about now, Woodline to Glen Manor, it's the commercial retail heart of the community. It's a it's commercial area. Uh, and we reference the importance of a number of buildings like the, the two rows of Price Club, Price Brothers buildings that occur on that stretch. Some images from that area. Public ground, more street embellishments such as benches, enhanced paving, and planting. So back to the fire hall, what we'd like to do, this is similar to a guideline that we wrote in York for protecting the view of the sketch that we did for the clock tower in Yorkville. And actually what is built now, according to the guideline, is the new Four Seasons. And you can see that that Four Seasons developed in a setback, picture on the left, to highlight the views of the clock tower very much in the same way that the sketch and the guideline dictated. So we will do that here. It's just a sketch that's in progress. And what that means is that from the corner of Woodline and Queen Street, when you're standing on the sidewalk, we like to maintain the view of that clock. And then if you actually extrapolate that backwards, then what you're actually doing is protecting the view of the clock from about two and a half blocks away, exactly the, uh, the, the uh, area that you see today. And certainly, one of the things that staff are closely looking at, of course, is the application that's proposed on the corner, which will be reviewed in conjunction with the findings of these guidelines. And then here's a view, an east review of that clock tower and the build form that is being suggested for this stretch of wood line. You can certainly see that the clock is still visible from vantage points to the east. Corners of buildings. In this area, one of the retail characteristics that we do see is the idea of a chamfered corner or a 45 degree. And what that does is just give some reading room to the intersection. And then in terms of the build form, we're going to run through some cross sections and show you how we arrive at that. So this is the cross section that we're proposing from the stretch largely from the wood line all the way to the end of the study area in the east. We started with that red point, which is that 4.8 meter setback from the, from the curve. We reinforce a three-story scale, in this case, nine and a half meters. The zoning bylaw that's being performed right now citywide is talking about retail that has a 4.5 meter ceiling height. We heard that that is too high for this neighborhood, so we're suggesting 3.5. But that's consistent about thinking back to that example of that building in Cabbage Town, which has a slightly higher retail than the adjacent retail, which just gives the retail a bit more uh, lofty appearance on the street. Uh, what we also heard is a step back to the fourth floor. We're doing so three meters. And then we also heard that we're to maintain the scale of the street. Now, this is approximately the as of right height. And what we're doing is something that is different in this case. Uh, it's creating an angle of being based on perception. So in terms of what is beyond that fourth floor, we do not want to see it when you're standing from the vantage point directly across the street. And that varies depending upon the lot depth. So we did this diagram to show where we have lots less than 30 meters, lots 30 to 40, and lots greater than 40. The vast majority are the lots that are 30 to 40 meters deep, that actually would, would result in this cross-section building. And we're zooming in on this particular precinct. And then we overlay that with the constraints map, and you see that even building, even sites that are deep may have many of them that may have constraints, such as rental housing or heritage. This is what that cross-section means, is that the large majority, about 55% of the lots, we'll see this cross-section, partial fifth floor. For about 25% of the lots, we'll see this cross-section, four-story building, because the lot is not deep enough. And then for about 20% of the lots, we'll see this cross-section with the with partial sixth floor. But that sixth floor is well set back, and we'll show you some comparisons. So that's just a massive diagram of that angle in the, in the, uh, in the that fourth floor set back. Here's a view of that from, again, across the street. And this is a comparison with the application at a level walking on the cloud, if any of you uh, know that building is. So I'll just flip back. And this is the comparison of the as of right. So 
So even if the acid right push goes up four, four floors straight up 12 meters, you can see that comparison. And then this is a comparison with 1960. So you can certainly see the vast difference between that application and what we are presenting today. And then on corners, we were asked to obviously study this in terms of how you uh, view this building in the corner. So we've done these studies in terms of looking at, this is now an elevation on Queen Street at a cross street. So if one lot were to redevelop, then you would get this profile, a setback fourth floor. Two lots, you would get a setback fourth and fifth. You'd actually have to have three lots wide, and if you had the depth, then you could actually accommodate a partial six And we've done a number of shadow studies comparing it to what is already as of right. As of right means what is permitted today. One would not have to seek planning approvals. Um, so the blue is the as of right, the green is the angular plane that's being proposed. And what you'll see in these cases is that there's very little difference. In fact, in, in some cases, because of the setback of the fourth floor, the shadows are um, improved. These are June, the shorter shadows are here. Uh, now I'll just highlight that because I know this was the topic of discussion. At 718, you can see that the proposed angle is starting to shadow the south side of Main Street, but so was the aspect of the And then at 818, when the sun is set, of course, the south side of the sidewalk in outdoor cafe season is in shadow. So the September shadows, and I'll highlight here, looking at September of 918, and the acid right has actually a slight shadow on the sidewalk, whereas the post angle is not. It's not a huge difference, but it is actually an improvement. And I'll just run through it again. You'll have them in your books and packages at leisure. So this is the proposed angle with the acid right height, red. This is the cross section that would be developed uh, by a mid rise building. We show this here just for comparison. That would dictate that a street wall of 16 meters and a 45 degree angle of plane. And you can see the differences between that red line and what we are proposing. It's the massing of the angular plane of the mid rise guideline and what we are suggesting. And again, this is the acid right. So the acid right, because it's going four stories straight up, you would certainly see less stuff. And that comparison can be further down. And this is a sketch that we actually started to put some of the guidelines together, breaking up the street wall, um, canopies, recessing the entrances, looking at the, the terracing that you see. And then lastly, in terms of the Bombay Beach precinct, again, it makes reference to Glen Manor and uh, Noble Park and Nursewood, fine grain and retail shops. The difference here is that we have a number of exclusively walking apartment buildings and residential buildings only on the See the scale of the street and the storefronts. Um, public ground, island forest gardens, of course, and the theme is a very important part of the menu for this area. Images of that. And then we're proposing the same angular plane for this area. So depending upon the lot depth, we we'll get either four, partial fifth, or partial sixth. And there's the lot depth again. Sorry, I'm like, happy to, just because so it's, a, it's, a lot it's a repetition of what we showed previously. So, it's a different area of the street, the lot depth will be different. Sure, yeah. So there's the lot depths. And what we will say is that some of these lots, even though they're deeper, right, uh, if you look at the other constraint map that we have, like this is, of course, the area of the building. Here we have a number of rental properties. And let me just explain that. If, if a property has more than six rental units, then the rental replacement policies will be in effect. And those rental units, their size and number, will have to be replaced in any new development. So that's why we say that it is certainly less likely that those sites would be redeveloped. What about laneways? Because that generally okay, If I could just move on, and I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. But does that uh, explain more? So we want a section about architectural design because there's a lot of discussion that we had. New development the beach will complement the character of the area and strive to achieve design excellence while being sensitive to the existing context. Again, the idea of fitting in is something that's very important. 
Um, the, the previous guidelines actually talked about a variety of styles that exist, so we actually reference them at length. We have them in the document. But we talked about the styles that exist, like Georgian, Victorian, Vienna, Guardian, Modern, Brick, Vernacular, and Octeco. Again, it's helpful in terms of understanding the context. Uh, transportation infrastructure. Now, again, as Nicole says, we know that this is a source of, um, of interest for the community. Um, new applications for site plan approval and rezoning, depending on their size, are going to be accompanied with a range of studies, including but not limited to transportation impact, parking studies, sun shadow diagrams, heritage impact studies, in order to support their application. All development applications, no matter how small, are required to be accompanied by servicing report and stormwater management reports. New developments are required to meet their bylaw minimums for visitor and resident parking on site. And opportunities for partnerships for new public parking lots in the area should be explored to enhance the capacity of the area to receive tourists and other visitors. Uh, report from Soy City staff and various technical departments, as you've heard, are here. And certainly, I would uh, welcome that you use that opportunity to ask them questions related to those issues that are of interest to you. Now, the report that accompanies these guidelines, which will be going to council, will be accompanied. Uh, come that accompanies this vision setting process will include a discussion about a number of concerns expressed by the community respecting the existing infrastructure. And Council may direct staff to conduct further studies to address these issues. I'm sure the Council will be speaking to that later. Uh, section on sustainability. New developments proposed for Queen Street East will strive to be modern, energy efficient, sustainable. All applications will be reviewed with the conforming to the Toronto Green Standard. This is a standard checklist that we actually that looks at all elements of sustainability in terms of high albedo, surfaces, uh, permeability of the streetscapes. And new development applications in the beach will strive to achieve extraordinary measures when dealing with stormwater management and sanitary drainage because we know that that is a big issue. Further new developments should reduce the heat island effect. <coughs> and then lastly, uh, we had a number of questions in terms of what the format for these guidelines are. So these are just covers of many other guidelines that we have written throughout the city, areas like St. Lawrence, Fleur, York, Hill, Kings, and The layout will be very similar to this. There will be a double column over the text, lots of maps, lots of descriptions, lots of photographs to help illustrate the characteristics that we are tabling today in the graphic With that, thank you for your patience. I know it's a long presentation. We did just want to go through
if the new official, if the new zoning is actually suggesting four and a half meters retail height, we think it should be lower, then that's something that we might do. But in terms of the built form that exists today west of Woodbine, we certainly see that as very different than east of Woodbine. So east of Woodbine, it's a nine and a half meter street wall. West of Woodbine, it would be consistent with one rings width. In fact, it's actually a little lower. Were you talking about the harmonized zoning bylaw, or are you talking about actually re-examining the zoning just of Queen Street? Sorry. You just need to use the mic. Okay. 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 Were you talking about rezoning or, or new zoning? Are you talking about the harmonized zoning bylaw, which actually leaves the height at 12 meters and density at two time all along Queen? It will be in place probably next year, and that has the minimum 4.5, which we want to change. Or are you saying that you are proposing that there now be another exercise where we will actually rezone Queen Street at a higher density and a higher heights? So we're not proposing to rezone Queen Street. Right now, now we are proposing build form guidelines. We're not proposing to rezone Queen Street. Okay. Anything else you with refinements? Yeah. Okay. Um, we'd like to see more detailed architectural rules to uh, maintain the character. And I guess the bottom line is we'd like to see the, the study extended to incorporate all the uh, sort of the, the ideas that are brought up. So we'd like to see more thought be brought into the study. More meetings. More meetings. Um, maybe more uh, feedback from not just community meetings, but if there's a way that we could kind of approach the neighborhood, whether it's some type of survey or, a, uh, as you mentioned at one time, a referendum, something that you can really get the voice of whatever it's that you I use that as an excuse to plug all the extra copies of the discussion guide that are there. It's a four pager. Maybe not everybody wants to take the book home. Um, take all of the extra copies with you. The council policy, and uh, uh, they will be uh, uh, the intention they be consistent with the policy, the official plan. So they will be supported by city staff. We'll be seeking uh, with the uh, development applications that they comply with these guidelines and uh, making recommendations to council on that basis. If they don't comply with the guidelines, then uh, uh, staff would have to consider whether to recommend refusal uh, of these applications and this could lead to uh, the OSB. Great. And should council uh, adopt these guidelines, then we will be maintaining guidelines in our recommendations to council. Again, council always makes the decision. Thank you. I mean, if there's a problem in the area, the development has to show us how the development will not make it worse. And in many cases, the new development will actually make it better because if we take an older site and making it a newer site, they'll be adhering to newer requirements, more stringent requirements. So they will, just by virtue of that logic, improve what's going on in the area. Not only just not making the worse to improve on it, but if you're speaking about asking the developer to go beyond their influence, if you will, we can't demand the developer do more to improve problems in the area. I mean, if there's an existing problem in the area, it's the city's responsibility to deal with it. We can't ask the developer to go beyond his limits to make improvements area wide, but we can make him show us how his area will not make the problem worse. And well improved by virtue of the impact on this specific site. But we can't demand that you go beyond this site to provide improvements. The more chance we'll have to get to everybody else. Okay, I want to talk about the fire hall and use the fire hall to start with. And the northwest corner, people standing there at eye level is to see the tower. Right now you can see the clock tower from Northern Dancer and Queen. Now one Rainsford is going in, it has setbacks. Two hundred Woodbine is going to be six stories straight up, which is really not necessary because you're going to have Greensford with setbacks, Florida Woodbine straight up. That property should be made to be set back so that from a distance you can still see the clock tower. It seems to have been consistent. It seems inconsistent to have one building with setbacks next to one that's straight up when, when obviously it would make the clock tower easier to see. Um, but also talking about 100 or 200 uh, Woodbine, I discovered late last night, actually, this went to council uh, on the 11th, and it wasn't mentioned that Mary Margaret didn't send out any notice of the preliminary report or anything like that having to do with it. 
So that preliminary report passed council. They're not going to do an avenue segment study for that building at all. So you're not getting a traffic study, an infrastructure study. A lot of the studies we're asking about here are required on an avenue if an avenue study hasn't been done. So that's not being done. The, the rationale for that in the study says, well, there was only one possible site west of Woodbine where you can have possible land assembly, which is incorrect because there's at least three at, at Kingston Road and two others. Plus, that site is right across the road from the Shell site. So the, 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 the legislation talks about where it could be a precedent. Clearly, clearly, the Shell site is going to be, when they do that, they're going to point across the road at a precedent on what goes on on the 200 Woodbine site. In the Licks development, they used the, the one Rainsford as a precedent to justify it. So we need an avenue study, an avenue segment study done for 200 Woodbine. And this is a... And this is part of the problem under 9.0 asking that study has been done because this isn't the first time because one Rainsford there was no segment study done. We didn't get the traffic studies and all of that. On Kippendavy there were some studies done. On Licks we didn't get a traffic study of Queen Street. We didn't get an infrastructure study. We didn't get a lot of the studies that needed to be done. And this seems to be standard. On, on 580 Kingston Road there are lots of studies that weren't done. It seems to be very typical. This is one reason why the studies have to be done before growth is allowed so that we have a, make sure we have enough capacity on the street for more cars and longer street cars. Apart from flooding and parking and other issues, the provincial policy statement says you're not supposed to allow growth without studying that there's enough infrastructure for the planned growth. Jamie came here and was saying that they're trying to design guidelines that they can defend at the OMB. What he's therefore really indirectly indicating is that anything under these guidelines, once these guidelines are passed, they are not going to defend it because now they've given away the game. Anything, a developer can still then go and ask for something more than the guidelines and maybe the OMB will get it. But we know at a very minimum they can get these guidelines at the OMB because the city is not going to fight anything less unless it's something really unusual like a heritage building or something. I'm just sorry, I just missed it. So I get it that you think that the studies aren't happening and that they need to be happening. Um, but um, you just said that you don't think the city will defend the defend these at the OMB. I, I just didn't catch the last part because somebody's filming. I'm directly saying they're not going to defend any development that is less than that. So in effect, if a developer comes in and wants to do something under this, it is going to get approved. The city is not going to fight it at the OMB, except for something like a heritage building or something really unusual that, that, that might be different. So these now become the minimum, and developers, knowing that this is the minimum, the city is not going to fight anything less, will be quite willing to, to ask for more. And I've seen this on Dundas West, where it's supposed to be 20 meter buildings, and they're approving 25 meter buildings. Okay, so this is... Okay. So, so, so the current guidelines, this is worse than the current guidelines, which say three stories, or the appearance of three stories, and don't say anything or indicate anything over 12 meters. We need to go back to those original guidelines and not show anything in here that shows anything above 12 meters. You can show a dotted line going off into, into infinity if you want, but, but anything in terms of actual buildings over 12 meters is opening the door and means that the planning department and city council will never defend anything. Okay. So these tanks of our residents, we have a whole, as you can see, very uh, experienced crowd in, in, uh, in architecture, sustainability, um, planning, and passionate residents just in general, and uh, I think that's really added huge value to our visioning study. I'd like to thank our knowledgeable city staff, and uh, especially all the senior staff that came all the way from all across the city tonight uh, to come here, and they've been working very hard on this, putting in a lot of hours. And of course, I, I want to thank the Toronto's best facilitator, Nicole.
think there is uh, a room to go. And, and the whole point of the visioning study was the next finding out what, else, what other concerns people have. And, and this is step one, and, and the other concerns are step two, three, whatever. So we've heard a lot of theory. Of course, the infrastructure, transportation, traffic, parking, all that is, is, a, is a big concern, and that's the next step. So I'm happy to work with you on, on that. And, and again, great job. Thank you. multiple times and not just the two statutory times.